Before we start, can I just say thank you to Dan for your leadership, uh, and thank you for, to everyone who's here, and thank you for everyone who's ever had anything to do with LSC. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as I uh, came this morning, my assistant said to me, LSC, there are a lot of things with LSC in your life. Uh, and, but this is the LSC. Um, and uh, I, I just can't help but reminisce and say that I came to Harvard Law School because of Gary Bellow. And um, the, the, this program was just in its infancy. And I offered the first class that had students who had placements who were here. Um, and you know, that's been a model, and it's kind of worked. And uh, it certainly made my chance to feel like law could be a partnership between practice and theory. So that partnership theme is going to guide us here today. Um, I want to say that innovation is another theme that I know our panelists are going to talk about. And this place is and has always been a place of innovation as well as justice. <coughs> partnership. Um, I am from Chicago, so I have to quote Michael Jordan. And he said, talent wins games, but teamwork and intelligence wins championships. Teamwork and the partnerships and the crossovers and the finding connections that people didn't know happen and creating links that make the chain stronger at every point. So, I'm going to invite the panelists to introduce each of themselves, although I have something to say about each of them anyway, um, and with descriptions of the origin of one or more, because several of you have more than one, partnerships that you'd like to describe. First, though, I do want to say, Jack, you were here at the beginning, uh, pro bono leader, partner from Wilmer, uh, and working uh, in this partnership. You'll talk about it, but now working here, here, here. It's amazing and fabulous. Uh, Nina, I'm not going to date you, but it's been a while. <laughs> and Robert, um, also, you were Robert's student. We I will was. hear about that connection. Uh, Brandon, you are an innovative genius, organizer, communicator. Toby, we first met at a law and social change retreat. <coughs> And now look at what you have done, what you've created, and we'll hear, hear a lot more about the partnerships. And uh, student debt is something that people understand in a way differently because of your work. So I had to say that, but now, Brandon, why don't you go first? Sure. Um, my name is Brandon German. I'm a community organizer. I really got involved in community organizing back in 2007 uh, during the foreclosure crisis, uh, working with City Life Beater Abana. Um, and really just uh, handling all of their media work and online communication work for uh, the public protests uh, that we do in terms of putting <laughs> pressure on the banks uh, during the foreclosure crisis. And uh, eventually that led to my work here at LSC, um, working with their newly launched uh, anti-foreclosure eviction defense uh, program, which was the Mattapan Initiative where we kind of uh, focused our efforts in the neighborhood of Mattapan because um, that was the hardest hit neighborhood uh, in the city in terms of foreclosure. And so we focused our efforts in, in Mattapan trying to uh, prevent uh, displacement, right? And, uh, and just uh, making sure that neighborhood uh, becomes stabilized because it was uh, ravaged by the uh, foreclosure crisis. So uh, my work really focused on campaigns uh, against displacement and uh, the predatory <coughs> lending practices of uh, Wall Street banks. So you demonstrate partners actually can move <coughs> homes. Mm -hmm. But is there another partner you want to call out here? Anybody here now, right, or no? Yeah, so uh, mainly the partnership uh, that I worked with was um, City Life Vita Urbana. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that partnership is a true, authentic partnership uh, in which uh, both sides benefit. You know, you have the law students from um, Harvard Legal Aid and LSC here uh, really helping uh, homeowners and, and tenants uh, fight displacement. You know, uh, law students learn uh, real life practices and they really learn what really happens, you know, in the real world. And uh, low income people, um, and, and they really understand, wow, the system is not what it seems, you know. Um, and then, of course, the families that are impacted uh, really benefit because they become empowered 
uh, learning the law because they get that legal in, uh, education from the students. So uh, it's a very uh, powerful partnership, very beneficial, and I was glad to be a part of it in terms of just helping people, uh, you know, uh, stay in their homes. And that Mattapan initiative, it, it was great work. I'm very proud of it. And um, that partnership is long lasting. It started about 35 years ago, but uh, we'll get, yeah, we'll right. get more into that. Super. Nina. Sure. Mm. So, um, I will date myself. Uh, I was a student here in 96, 97 or so, and I came to LSC as an attorney right after that, so right after grad school, right after law school. Um, I started working with Robert in the Living Legacy Project, providing legal services to families affected by HIV and AIDS. Um, and interestingly, we're talking about partnerships, that was a similar partnership um, with AIDS Action with GLAAD, with other LBGD organizations in the area. Uh, a, few, a few years later, I moved to the Family Law Unit. <clears throat> At that time, <clears throat> there was no domestic violence in the name. It was the Family LGBT Unit to reflect that kind of partnership with uh, gay and lesbian um, legal issues. And while I've, re I've remained in the Family Law Clinic, the clinic itself has morphed, um, depending on the partnerships that we've had. And in addition to providing legal services um, to families in traditional family law domestic relations um, area, it is adapted to meet the needs of the community um, based on our different partnerships. And right now, we're now the Family, family Domestic Violence Law uh, Clinic. Um, before I talk about the Passageway Health Law Collaborative, um, our long-term uh, partnership now, I do want to uh, pause and kind of acknowledge the folks from Passageway, if that's okay. Please. I can talk about um, actually, I think it's just one, and one is on her way. Um, from Passageway and the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and ask them to introduce themselves, if that's um, okay. And that way, at some point in this, in this conversation, if they pipe up, you all know who, um, who she is. So Marty, just very briefly, can oh you just God, mention who you are? Hi, Marty. And what you do? Hi, Marty. Marty Started doing this work and now have been really in administration for the last 10 years with this program. So looking forward and um, honored to be part of this and the amazing legacy and work that's happened. So thank you guys all for sharing with us today. Wonderful. Great. And we'll see Marty later on this evening. Great. Um, so I would also be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Sarah Boonin, um, who's here and, and you all met uh, this morning, who found, actually founded the, the Passageway Health Law Collaborative and was instrumental in raising um, it through its young formative years. I kind of feel like an adoptive, kind of a <laughs> adoptive foster parent who is now kind of stepping in um, and when the child has already been taught manners and things like that, and I'm just kind of keep, <laughs> keeping it going and make sure it doesn't, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't die. Um, anyway, Sarah started the past, started the partnership and um, it was such a solid project um, that, that got started almost 15 years ago, that it's, it's real, really pretty strong. Genesis, it's kind of hard. You mentioned, Sarah, when you were talking in your first panel about how it's hard to talk about clinical legal education with Jean right, sitting right beside you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's kind of hard to talk about the genesis of the passageway, passageway program with you sitting right there. So I'm going to do my best. Hopefully I do it justice, and we'll go from there. Um, so it was, it was formed in uh, 2005 as an innovative partnership between the Brigham and Women's Hospital and, uh, and LSC to provide critical, um, critical legal services to low-income victims of domestic violence. Um, essential to the genesis of the project was recognizing that DV was a serious public health issue in addition to a legal issue. Um, that, and it, it, so that in addition to the physical and the emotional scars that it leaves, it also is the cause of the breakup of families, uh, financial instability, economic instability, housing instability, uh, unemployment, um, health care and disability needs, negative impacts of children uh, in uh, their education. So the idea was that there needs to be an integrated response to these legal and medical and social concerns that are, that are um, 
occurred simultaneously when we have domestic violence uh, situations. And at the time, back in 2005-ish, there, no there were no programs in Massachusetts um, with that coordinated social, medical, legal services um, for victims of DV. So Sarah thought, very smartly, that by reaching clients in the hospitals, um, in their healthcare settings at hospitals and affiliated community health centers, and by structuring a teamwork, a team of folks between the parents, uh, I'm sorry, between the patient social workers and lawyers, that we would be able to offer comprehensive legal assessments early um, to prevent or attempt to prevent um, the, the issues related to domestic violence. So that continuum of services would include crisis legal intervention, long-term legal uh, and safety planning, legal consultations, and full-scale legal representation, um, all in conjunction with the advocacy provided by skilled non-lawyer advocates from the passageway uh, program at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Why did we choose Brigham and Women's? Um, I'm not exactly sure what Sarah's research methods were, but she eventually <laughs> learned that Passageway had, had been provide Passageway at the um, at the Brigham had been providing consultation, social services, referrals for victim victims of domestic violence for 10 years prior. Um, and she also learned that they had identified a pressing need um, among, among its clients for legal services related to domestic violence. But they lack the resources and the training to provide such services, which is oftentimes, of course, how, uh, how partnerships um, evolve. So this information com combined with the realization that our own cases, the cases that were coming into LSC through our regular intake processes, processes walk-ins, things like that, almost all had an element of domestic violence. So even if they came in presenting with a different legal need, a housing need, a family need, a bankruptcy, consumer, whatever it is that they were coming to us for, once we started to work up the case, we found that there was a domestic violence component to that case and to that client. So all of those things, I think, kind of put together um, um, helped Sarah to kind of think, well, let's, let's try to do something about this. So um, the Passageway Health Law Co Collaborative was born. Um, so at the time, um, they provided direct legal services to victims and survivors of DV, particularly in the, uh, the areas of domestic uh, guardianship, estate planning, and referrals to other, other clinics in the center. I found out last night at dinner, I didn't know this, but um, and I think I got it right, that Sarah's initial um, instinct was to, instead of have it focus on family law, was to have it focus on health law and disability um, and things like that. So, but that's what, that wasn't the need of what Passageway wanted. So our partnership kind of drove, or the partner that we had chose, kind of drove the, um, the way the partnership, um, the path of it. Uh, and we ended up kind of understanding that we needed that, that collaboration, but instead of focusing on um, disability or employment, we focused on what the needs of the passageway had identified, which, are, which is family law, and which is what we do um, now. So we do a whole bunch of things. I think we'll probably get into it as we go along, but that's kind of how we started. And um, yeah. Thank you. Robert, who are you? And tell us your origin. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Robert Greenwald. I'm a clinical professor of law here at the law school and the faculty director of what's called the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation of Harvard Law School. Um, really a pleasure to be here and to talk about the role that the legal services has played for a really long time in fostering community partnerships. So I'm great to be part of this panel. Uh, I'm going to date myself as well. Um, I first came to the Legal Services Center in 1984, which was the summer of my 1L year of law school. I have to say, from the moment I walked in the door, I thought, oh my god, this is exactly what I've been looking for and where I want to work. So for me, like a lot of the drama that people go through in trying to figure out where they want to be was over for me because I knew this was it. Um, the combination of service to the community and the opportunity to teach and mentor students was really just like the perfect fit for me. 
Um, so ultimately, I worked at the Legal Services Center for over 25 years. Um, the last six years of my time here, I was the faculty director of the center, and I stopped being the faculty director in 2014 because I created this new center, the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation in 2011, and was running the two, and then Dan came along to take over this one, and I now run this other one. So today what I want to really, I'm going to focus on is the creation of the HIV Law Clinic, um, the first in the nation HIV law program in the country. Uh, that was created here at the center. And um, for us, in terms of collaborations, I don't necessarily see collaborative partners here, but I just thought I would ask, like, how many people here in this room either worked on a case, an AIDS law case, or witnessed a will, did a home visit or a hospital visit with me? Can you just, like, raise your hands to show? I mean, so just to say, I mean, it was an incredible collaboration. Um, and in this case, collaboration certainly with the AIDS Action Committee, GLAD, many other health and social service organizations, but also with many of the other programs here in the law school to make it possible and for us to become what we became. And then just to say, so in terms of my center now, we've really evolved in some ways, focused much more on advocacy, community mobilization, and impact litigation, but all of it is really informed by, by my over 20 years of direct service work. Uh, my name's uh, Jack Regan. My profile is a little different from um, the people you've heard today. Um, I was not an LSC student. In fact, shockingly, I did not go to Harvard Law School. Um, but they still let me be on the panel. Um, I went to one of those places in New York City. Um, I spent um, my career at Wilmer Hale, uh, then known as Hale and Dorr, and was raised as a general trial lawyer, um, and then was asked um, probably 25 years ago now to spend my time dealing with technology companies and intellectual property litigation. So, um, but in the course of that, I um, did a number of pro bono cases and was offered the tremendous privilege for the past uh, 15 or so years to be co-chair of the firm's pro bono program, which was robust at Hale and Dorr, but when Hale and Dorr merged in 2004 with Wilmer Cutler and Pickering, which also had a very uh, uh, substantial uh, pro bono culture. Uh, it really became an international pro bono powerhouse. And I, and I had the privilege as the co-chair to be managing this program where we were opening four to eight pro bono cases per day worldwide. Uh, so um, doing things in Germany and London as well as Dedham. So it was the whole the whole spectrum of experience, every kind of pro bono case you can imagine from the Boston Municipal Court to the United States Supreme Court. Um, and um, part of my responsibility uh, during that time um, was to uh, manage the relationship with the Legal Services Center. So I had that professional relationship with the Legal Services Center, but before that, as uh, a young, busy lawyer, in the early 90s, I get to watch this place get created. I get to watch the two guys who you will hear about this evening at 5 o'clock, Jack Kogan and John Hamilton, uh, through through different set of skills and different visions, um, think about what this could be if the dream th that Gene Charn talked about, to have a separate location that would be community-based and do community-based lawyering, would come to fruition in a building like this. And in their wildest imaginations, I don't think they would have envisioned this level of success. But um, you'll hear more about that tonight. So I got to watch that happen, and then later, later on got to manage the relationship. So um, um, I uh, retired from Wilmer Hale on September 1 after a mere 40 years there, mm -hmm. and um, um, had been working during the course of that time with uh, Dan Nagan and Betsy Gwynn and uh, Dana Montalto in the uh, Veterans Clinic uh, because we had crossed paths, I think, maybe initially at the Boston Bar Association. And um, so Dan said, uh, would you like to come and spend some time with us? And uh, I said, wow, what, what, what an opportunity. And so I consider myself very fortunate. And I'll be happy to talk later about the 
partnership and the details of it. As long as you let me rely upon picking up on your teamwork idea, four colleagues who are here who can tell it from their perspective. Want to introduce them now? I would. Rich Johnston, who is the chief legal officer of the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. He knows our keynote speaker. Um, <laughs> Hugh, Hugh Jones, who's a retired corporate partner who did many important pro bono cases. The one that comes to my mind is being a key lawyer for City Year. Uh, Rob Tuckman, who's a retired uh, real estate lawyer who did so much pro bono in the real estate area, I can't begin to describe it, but the Central Lottery Committee comes to mind. He, he, he kept the peace during the big dig. And uh, Belinda Duran, who's a technology licensing lawyer, uh, who's, who's had a relationship with um, the center and the students from a variety of perspectives that she can talk about. Wonderful. Toby. <coughs> I'm Toby Merrill. I, um, I direct the Project on Predatory Student Lending here at the Legal Services Center. I've been here in that capacity since 2012 when I started as a fellow. But before that, I was a student here. I started in 2009. And it's, it's actually really humbling to be in the room with so many of my teachers and some of my students. Um, so thank you. Um, I want to tell a story today about um, something that happened just a few years ago when Corinthian Colleges was starting to shut down in 2014. We all knew it was coming. This was an enormous company, but it was also an enormous fraud, and it was happening all across the country. There were over 100,000 students. There were um, more than 70 campuses, and everyone saw this company was about to collapse. And the question was, what was going to happen to the students who were enrolled, and what was going to happen to the students who had been enrolled, maybe had gotten their credentials, but those credentials were worthless because for many years this company had just been taking people in, giving them student loan debt, which at least um, some of the people in the room know is presumptively non-dischargeable in bankruptcy, um, you know, can be collected through some of the core anti-poverty benefits by, by just taking that money instead of letting it go to help people live their lives. And um, the project was here at that time, right? I had been here for a couple of years thinking about how to apply the litigation model of the predatory lending clinic, which is um, a mixture of individual representation with the aim of high impact litigation to the for-profit college industry. And um, with the twin goal that Blake mentioned earlier of putting myself out of business, right? We just want to shut down the bad guys and go do something else. Like I believe that those skills are transferable. Um, and as the company started to shut down, an amazing thing happened, which is that the students started to get together. And first it was um, the Corinthian 15, and there were 15 borrowers, and they went on debt strike. And they said, we're not going to pay these bogus debts. Like, this isn't a legitimate debt that we owe. And it took a lot of courage. And then it was the Corinthian 100. And by the time that um, that a giant red box of loan cancellation applications was delivered to the US Department of Education, there were 10,000. And now there are over 180,000 applications to cancel bogus student loan debt sitting at the Department of Education. And it's really due to the work of one of our partners, the Debt Collective. And um, they're organizers, and they're thinking about organizing from a different perspective, right? Because these are people across the country. It's not housing. It's not, um, it's not land use. It's debt. And so it's something that people are ashamed of, that they don't like talking about, that has no geographical connection, that has no outward manifestation in the same way that some of the other um, uh, issues that tend to foment organizing do. And so um, they're, they're innovating and thinking about how to approach this problem from an organizing perspective. And at the same time, um, we are trying to work with them as legal partners. Change of administration changes some of the dynamics. Um, uh, so uh, some of you have already started to talk about the sources of your partnerships, uh, and some haven't. But I want to turn the focus to challenges. But anyone who hasn't yet said enough about the sources, please do do so. So Robert, you want to start? Sure. <laughs> so you know, I ended up finishing law school, clerkship, and I got hired here. So my dream came true. That was 1987. Um, but frankly, there was a really dark cloud hanging over me, and I think over many people in the United States. In, in my case, you know, the AIDS epidemic had really taken hold. 
Um, the only other out gay man in my law school class died that year. I lost three friends from college that year. Uh, many people that I knew were petrified. And you were just basically seeing in the newspaper, like every day, somebody that got thrown out of their house or lost their job or some other form of discrimination. And I literally, I was here for six months when I realized this is my perfect job, but I feel like I really have to do something. So I went to Gene and Gary, and I said, and explained to them what was going on for me, and that I felt like I needed to do something. And Gene and Gary said, definitely. We definitely need to do something. Um, and then that Friday was staff meeting, and we went to staff meeting, and we talked about it, and every person said, I mean, at least one or two people in every of the different clinics said, I'll help. I'll do what I can. Um, Frankly, it was the day like I realized, oh my god, I really did have the perfect job and that this place is truly committed to being a laboratory for innovation, is truly committed to community lawyering and addressing the needs that are going on in the community, and then as a teaching institution really to exposing our law students to really what's going on in the community and being part of community lawyering. So I was charged with basically contacting what was then AIDS Action Committee, which was literally in the basement of a community health center, you know, really didn't have much programming, but were, it was this guy, Larry Kessler, who was literally basically going to people's hospitals and taking care of them as they were dying. And I said, you know, first of all, I didn't have very many legal skills, but I was going to rely on a lot of other people's at the time and said, um, we want to help. We don't know what the legal issues are, but we want to help. And they were thrilled and said, we'll start getting the words out. And they did have a list of people like who they knew living with HIV, and they started making phone calls. And they had a newsletter that they would also give to people that were coming for appointments. And truly, our phone never stopped ringing off the hook for 20 years. We became the largest legal service provider in the state for people living with HIV, providing direct service on a broad range of issues that did change and evolve over time, but always involved some public-private benefits issues, health, disability, life insurance, all of that kind, some discrimination cases, a lot of estate planning cases, literally, er, particularly early on, um, we were helping people prepare for dying and guardianship cases. Um, every single person that worked in the center um, did home visits. We did hospital visits. And we were constantly, like every morning, it would be, who's available to come to go to the hospital with me? Like the front desk would have to like figure it out so somebody be a witness. So that went on for a long period of time. And just to say, so that continued. But what it also started to feel like very quickly was there were no real legal solutions for many of the problems we were facing, right? And the needs were really changing dramatically. And we were putting Band-Aids on the same problems when there was a solution, but often there wasn't. And so in this is all, by the way, in collaboration with the AIDS Action Committee and these other community-based organizations. It got so that it felt like we were truly like drinking from a fire hose to the point where we contacted AIDS Action Committee and said, we need to form like a legal task force, which is what we formed. And uh, Linda Giles and I led that, Judge Giles now. Um, and then we trained lawyers all throughout Massachusetts to be, basically be able to help us handle the cases. The cases would come in to me at the center. Linda and I would then divide them up, figure out who was going to do what, um, talk about the collaboration with Wilmer Hale. And we did thousands and thousands of estate plans for people, many of whom, tens of thousands of people that are now dead, mostly. Um, but uh, Nan Geiner, Kim Cohn, they literally must have reviewed a thousand or two thousand of my original estate plans so I felt confident to know that I what I was doing. Rich Johnson, Joe Barry helped us on our litigation cases. I literally I didn't and Gary of course and Jean um, to make this all possible. Um, and then over time, so we're doing all this direct service work and also realize that we had to address some of the systemic problems. I Quickly, I could tell just two examples. One is this issue. Over time, we started to see more and more women living with HIV. And they were really coming to us, and the biggest issue they were confronting was knowing that they were likely going to become incapacitated and then ultimately die, and what was going to happen to their children. And the truth is there were not any great answers, because the only thing you could do at the time was a testamentary disposition, which is basically a statement in your will as to who you wanted. Or you could try to do a co-guardianship, which meant you'd name the person to be the guardian during your lifetime, but you'd give up exclusive control over your child. Both of those options were terrible. 
So we started doing research and found that people were talking about this thing called standby guardianship, which allowed a woman or any parent, custodial parent, to have a court hearing, decide who would be the guardian of the child. And frankly, this was all about most of the women being, it's mostly women, being concerned about the biological fathers getting control of these children for many reasons why they shouldn't be. And so we decided, we created a group, our students, uh, called Women of Action. Amy Rosenberg, if she's here somewhere, helped lead it. And we literally organized our women clients. We, the students interviewed them. We took pictures of them and their kids. We made a brochure, pamphlet, and we just started working the legislature. And what we were told, even the people that really were supportive of us, that this would take 10 years to get probate legislation through. We got it through in a year. And as a result of that, we were then able to have women have hearings before a judge. The biological fathers could come. Anybody else could come. And the judge would make the decision right then and there as to who would get custody of the kids. And so that was sort of the movement of us not only doing direct service work, but policy work, which kind of informs what I do now. One other quick example. By 1996, we actually had effective treatment, and that was a game changer. But the problem was that both the Medicaid and Medicare program, the two public programs, are really disability care programs. They're not health care programs, particularly pre-Affordable Care Act. So in the context of HIV disease, if you were low income, for med eligible for Medicaid based on income, you still needed, needed to meet a category of eligibility. In the case of HIV disease, it meant disability. And so what it meant is there was this cruel irony that you had to become so sick and disabled by age that you could get access to the, to the program to get the care and treatment that could have prevented you from getting so sick in the first place. And we said, this is ridiculous. And people were coming to us, like, I'm going to die because I'm not getting these medications. So again, we organized, we mobilized AIDS Action Committee. By that point, we had formed a Massachusetts AIDS Policy Task Force, which I think I chaired for 17 years or something. But we started going to the governor's office, started going to the legislature, started going to Mass Health. And frankly, Massachusetts became the first state in the nation in 2001, which changed the policy and basically turned it into, if you were 200% of the federal poverty or lower, and the moment you tested positive for HIV, you were eligible. And just to give you a sense, this is 10 years before the Affordable Care Act, right, did Medicaid expansion. What that meant by 2010, when the Affordable Care Act was enacted, was 80% of people with HIV in Massachusetts were engaged in care, as opposed to 37% nationally. 59% had suppressed viral loads, as opposed to 25% nationally. Suppressed viral load not only means you're healthy, as we knew then, but now we know that you can't transmit the virus if you're virally suppressed. As a result of that, we had dramatic decreases beyond anything else, anywhere else in the country in terms of declines and deaths and new transmissions of HIV. And again, just all of that part of a coalition that was so much the started from Gene and Gary saying to me, like I knew nothing at the time, um, yeah, let's do this, and then literally mobilized GLAD, AIDS Action Committee, community-based organizations across the state to truly tra help transform Massachusetts into help transform Massachusetts into a post-health care reform state in a pre-reform country, which frankly is the work that I kind of then ultimately as the epidemic change, we'll talk more about that later, have transitioned to. Yeah, I remember so well the early discussions about the standby guardianship because people said you can't have that. You either have one guardian or you have another guardian and they can't do it. You can't do it. And I think that LSC is a perfect uh, uh, demonstration that things that can't be done get done. Um, so, so who who else would, would Brandon? Great. Yeah. So uh, with uh, City Life, um, City Life is a grassroots uh, community organization uh, that fights for racial, social, economic justice, and the partnership with LSC started about 35 years ago um, when the campaign um, when the first campaign was the eviction free zone in uh, Eggleston. It ranged from like Eggleston to like Franklin Park down to like Green Street. It was like like almost 60 blocks of like this area. There's no evictions happening in this area, and so uh, LSC partnered with City Life, and they provided legal education and um, assistance with the legal proceedings uh, during evictions. And so uh, that's how it started, and just grew from there. And you know, uh, 35 years uh, in the making, and it's still strong. <coughs> and, and I think it's just a testament to uh, that partnership because it's really authentic 
um, there's a value on both sides, you know, the, um, the people facing foreclosure and eviction, uh, they're empowered uh, with the help and the education from the attorneys and the attorneys, the, the law students, they receive a real education in um, the struggles of low-income people. And so I think that partnership alone uh, is very transformative because they see both sides and um, and it just sometimes, I, for me, as well as for, I'm pretty sure, some of the students, uh, you get angered by what, what happens, you know, when you see, you know, the, the, the issues and the, uh, the systematic, uh, you know, uh, uh, institutions, the, the issues and the racial, um, this institutional racism that goes on in uh, marginalizing people. And so you get angered, and so it just makes the law students work harder, makes uh, me as a community organizer work harder to kind of make the system fair, you know, try to correct the system. And so uh, some of the challenges that I face, um, you know, when I was here, I did uh, community outreach work. And so some of the challenges, there's trust issues, and so you have to overcome that. Uh, and also, people are just ashamed. They think that um, they're the reason for uh, falling to foreclosure, but I let them know that they were the victim, you know. Uh, it was systematic, it was widespread, and so they was the victim. And so once we get past the trust issues and we invite them to the community meetings over at City Life, um, they begin to open up and then they learn, they feel comfortable, and that's when the empowerment begins. And so um, I just think it's a, it's, a, it's a great partnership because uh, lives are transformed. And, you know, some of the challenges, you know, you don't win, you know, every case, right? You don't win every case. However, um, you know, you are empowered when you fight. And so when you're facing foreclosure and everything is, you know, falling apart in your life, but you know you're a part of a community that supports you, uh, that's very important. And uh, the partnership with City Life is uh, just it's a true partnership. It's not for optics, right? You know, a lot of times partnerships, they form because, um, you know, someone wants some money, you know, for fundraising purposes, or they're trying to further their brand. But it's not the case with City Life. Um, you know, it's not charity work. You know, when the students come and, and, and help the people facing foreclosure and, evic uh, and eviction, it's not charity work. They really get involved because, uh, you know, people's lives are at stake. Their livelihood is at stake. And so they work that much harder to uh, overcome the barriers. And so um, when we did our work in Mattapan, you know, we saw uh, we saw so many issues in terms of um, people just uh, leaving, abandoning, abandoning their homes. And so because what will happen is that the banks will use scare tactics uh, to get people out of their homes and they just abandon their homes, they just leave. And so part of my task was to educate them, say, no, you don't leave, you know, we have to protect your legal rights. And so we educate them, and once we educate them, and then uh, they're empowered, they help others, you know, because they have a family member or another friend. And so that's always rewarding when you see that. And so um, just in terms of those challenges, just making sure that they know their legal rights, they don't need to leave their home unless a judge uh, tells them they need to leave their home. And basically, just um, just give them that support, that support system. And so a lot of times, a lot of times, uh, people who uh, go through this alone, they don't have that support system, and so they break down, then it leads to the health issues and things like that, which is another challenge. But uh, having that partnership in that community, I think, is uh, very unique, and so unique that the model has been replicated. like. And across the country, you know, Rhode Island, Chicago, St. Louis, Seattle, and so that's a testament to how well it works because it's it's been replicated so many times. And so, um, yeah, you know, challenges. You don't win everything, but you know, there's triumph and winning. But it's always it's empowerment and fighting. So that's. Uh, that's and it. maybe twice.
featured on NewsHour, uh, PBS, and when I had a meeting at the Department of Justice, and I said, we have this initiative that puts together organizers and students mm -hmm. and lawyers. Says, oh, we know all about it. They said, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And nationwide reach, you know, uh, what, what the work that we was doing, you know, uh, I mean, it's very, uh, you should be like, you know, Julia's right here. She was my colleague and doing this work. And, and I'm very proud, I know she's very proud of this work because it has national reach. You know, it's been replicated all over the world. You know, the model that City Life uses is the sword and the shield, you know, the sword, you know, the public uh, protests and fighting, then Julia with the shield as the lawyer, legal defense. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a, it's a match made in heaven. It, it, it works very well, um, you know, uh, the direct action model. Um, but yeah, I'm very proud of it. And uh, we could go on and on, but. You no, know. it's fantastic. Julia, uh, do you want to say anything? No, I mean, you know, this is a. This was a really special collaboration and it continues today. I know the students are over at City Life every Tuesday night continuing to do intakes and to work, you know, alongside folks who are facing primarily eviction now. We're kind of in a moment where there's not so much of a foreclosure crisis, but um, certainly a, a mass displacement um, in, in a lot of neighborhoods in Boston and really standing beside uh, tenants uh, and communities who are fighting to, to stay in their homes and uh, for you know, to advance a right to housing and, and a right to the kind of economic justice that we spent some time talking about this morning. So, yeah. I, I want to add that uh, in our work, uh, one of the issues uh, Julia will raise when we're dealing with someone being evicted post foreclosure, um, say that the landlord doesn't uh, keep the house habitable. You know, uh, there's issues in the house. And so Julia will find these issues and it'll be a counterclaim in the case and you know we'll use that to kind of you know keep the people in their home and so if we keep them in there a day longer that's a victory you know that's a win for us and so uh she did a great job with that and uh, it was one of the strategies that we used to kind of you know uh make the movement grow great yeah. jack do you want to talk about more about uh partnerships with wilmer or challenges or sure well why don't i deal with the partnerships first and maybe great. circle back on the challenges later um let me talk first about um, the founding of this place and what happened. Um, as I understand it, and I was watching it, not in it, um, uh, Jack Hogan, who was a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School, um, was the co-chair of a capital campaign at the law school. That's true. And um, capital campaign chairs are tasked often with dealing with uh, faculties and deans, particularly deans who have a wish list for what they would like to be funded. Um, and often it's an ambitious wish list. Uh, and one of the items on this wish list uh, was a new home for the Legal Services Center for all the reasons which Jean Charn described this morning. So Jack Kogan, um, and he told me this himself when I met with him maybe three or four weeks ago, uh, he's now 91 years old, um, saw this as a tremendous opportunity for um, Hale and Dorr, but also for Harvard Law School, because he sensed um, the potential, given the leadership that Gary and Gene and the then Dean uh, Bob Clark provided. So uh, John, uh, so uh, Jack brought this back to the firm, and uh, Jack Hogan had been the managing partner there in the early 80s, early to mid 80s. Um, but the person running the show at the time was John Hamilton, who happened to be a real estate lawyer. Uh, and when um, Jack Kogan approached him with this, uh, John was all in as fast as um, you could imagine. And John Hamilton was the guy who really implemented the vision that Jack Kogan brought to the table. This would not have happened without both of them. I don't think either one of them, for a variety of reasons, could have pulled it off. But it was a it was it was a real um, instance of what Martha talked about in terms of teamwork. Uh, Jack Kogan made a very substantial personal contribution, and then uh, the firm made a substantial contribution, and then um, individual partners at Harvard. I don't know how 
deeply uh, these guys' pockets were picked, but um, um, two million dollars was raised, mm -hmm. which in the early 90s was, was a non-trivial amount of money. And this building um, <coughs> was purchased, I think um, Harvard and Gene and Gary had their eye on it, but it was purchased, it was gutted. If you've looked at any of the materials around the room and in your booklet, it was completely gutted. Um, it was a former factory um, and uh, rehabbed into the uh, facility which you see now. Um, there was a big dedication. Mayor Flynn uh, presided. The state, state uh, legislators were here. Um, Dean Clark was here. It was quite something. And if you have time, look at uh, some of the materials in the room because you will see the invitation to that uh, and some photographs associated with it. Um, this booklet, which was published 10 years out, um, tells uh, the story of the founding in more detail than I'm going to go into, and uh, it as well is over there. Um, so um, that was the part, and then the hard work began, the hard work of collaboration, because this was not just about a piece of real estate. It was about trying to create a new model, and I'm not quite sure because I wasn't involved in the conversations uh, who led on that issue, whether it was Gary and Jean or Jack and John, my guess is it was probably uh, both of them, both sets. But the idea came about, well, maybe there would be an opportunity for the lawyers at Hale and Door to participate in the life of the center by being supportive of the teams that existed here at the time. Now, um, this was um, an innovative uh, notion to take uh, a major law school that was doing this community-based lawyering uh, at a place not on its main campus, and they were going to link up with this uh, big law firm, and we were going to put these two very different universes together to, to take care of low-income clients in a collaborative fashion. So uh, a lot of time was spent listening to one another, to figuring out uh, how we could work effectively together. I think there were some questions raised about could we work effectively together uh, because it was uh, very much of um, a grand idea. And as we all know, um, there are a lot of grand ideas that die a warning because they're not implemented well. And I think this one was implemented well because of, of the extent of the listening that went on and the understanding of the needs of the different parties that were brought to the table. So as it played out, and, and I got involved in the administration of this probably 10 years after the events I'm talking about, um, there, there, there started to be a regular flow of people um, coming here, doing various things, uh, and there began to be a, a flow of cases coming to the firm where the center said, we have a matter, uh, we either can't do it or we don't have the um, um, resources where we can handle it, would you take this as a pro bono case? Or in many, many other matters, it was a partnership where we were going to be co-counsel. And um, there, there were then uh, several lawyers, one of whom's in the room, who were seconded here for a period of time um, at a stage in their career where they wanted to do this. So, there was a lot of innovative thinking about um, how to make this relationship um, uh, one that would be rich on both sides and most importantly, uh, take care of the clients uh, for whom uh, one plus one equal four as far as we could tell. Um, my involvement um, was, was to really deal with the intake of the cases. There were conflicts that had to be resolved obviously on both sides. Uh, I had to make sure the staffing was right on our end, that the supervision was there, and that there was a line, there was, there was a good line of communication between the lawyers at the center and, and the lawyers at our place. And of course, there would be transition at both, where we had to make sure that um, the clients were uh, handled correctly. <coughs> felt threatened in some way by the work that the uh, lawyers were doing in connection with the clinic, because that presumably had to be managed 
the banks or the hospitals or whoever, well, whoever the institutional clients of Hale and Door were, there must have been some PR or some effort that to, to manage those conflicts. Well, the, the, there, was, there were sort of two kinds of conflicts implicit in, in your question. Uh, legal conflict where we couldn't do the case because we either um, represented somebody on the other side. Okay. That's what I think in our world we'd call a business conflict. Okay? In other words, somebody who was uh, coming forward with a case which created a business issue. And there was a committee which would look at that. And in certain instances we said we can't do the case because the business issue is so pressing it creates uh, problems for the clients that we just can't work through. There were other, other matters where we would say to the client, we're going to do the case. So I, um, there was no universal per se way to handle that. Every case was looked at indiv individually. At the time, there was a conflicts committee which, which addressed such things. But, but, but we did split it just like you described between legal conflicts where we couldn't do it. But actually, uh, the practice we had was not bank, insurance, or hospital heavy. Our client base was technology companies, so we had a lot less of it than, dare I say, certain other firms in town might have had because of, the, of their practice groups. I don't recall a lot of that. There were issues later on in the 2009 recession uh, with the foreclosure work where there were certain issues presented that we couldn't do. But what I remember most was, you know, 90% of the cases that we were doing just cleared and off we went. So, um, so, so my, my job, as I said, was to deal with the training, with the uh, uh, staffing and the supervision. And um, in addition to doing pro bono cases, we also came out and did trainings. So uh, we came out here and did s sessions on expert depositions, on mediation, on appellate argument, on electronic documents, on document management, on a whole host of things where uh, we had a lot of expertise and we certainly had systems in place which um, could be used for the benefit of the st staff lawyers and uh, clients here. Um, so maybe I should now quickly talk about just a couple of the specific areas that we work with. I'm going to interrupt for one minute and can I cold call Jean? <laughs> Would you like to reflect at all on the origin and or this question about conflicts? Yes, things were running through my head as you spoke. Oh, sorry. I'll stand up. Um, um, I, I know that we, the issue of conflicts was um, one on both sides. I, I just, I have to say um, that I don't recall a single time, and I'm sure I would have known, that we um, had anything that wasn't resolved rather smoothly and whatever. You, it, it seems like that would be a big issue, but it really wasn't. There were some other very interesting issues, though. Um, I think both sides, uh, particularly the students, uh, might have had ideas about what corporate lawyers did and what legal aid lawyers did. And maybe some, we often were working with a junior partner in the firm, a senior would know, and there were a number of occasions when, particularly when uh, we started the um, transactional clinic and small business clinic, uh, which, which Brian Price headed up, um, that we went to Helen Door when we got stuck on some complicated um, issue we thought about business management, and usually we would get the answer right away. But a couple of times, what the partner at the firm or the whoever, whoever we were dealing with said was, that's a really interesting issue. And the idea was, there are complicated issues out there in work for small businesses and low-income clients. It's not just simple and we get a lawyer and it all goes through. And there was on the, um, I think, on the legal aid side of it, um, um, uh, a much better understanding about the commitment that many um, firms and corporate lawyers make um, around legal services that it's uh, deep and genuine and um, um, I, th I think this, it was a key, um, it was a key phase in the development of the center that, um, that Hale and Dorr uh, gave us this building and, um, and sponsored it. I will tell you that um, Bob didn't tell Gary and I anything about it. 
So you were negotiating the terms of the donation. We had no idea that it was happening. And he came home one night and said, we're going to get a new building. And they changed the name of the program. <laughs> So we, we had to deal with staff. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> but I think that was necessary to the arrangement. And after, uh, Gary knew John Hamilton. They were classmates. Right. And I think that was a critical part of the trust that was there this was all, from the beginning. This was all way above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was above mine, too, <laughs> and Gary. So, but it couldn't have turned out uh, better. It couldn't have turned out better. So, um, well, let me ask a couple of my colleagues who um, lived through this as well. Rob, do you want to say anything? I, was, I, I do the real estate work, so I was very much aware of the potential for conflict, but in fact, the firm didn't represent any bank. We did with a few uh, construction loans or alternative loan projects for children when they came to that court. So, um, so that... That, that was not an issue. And especially if we represented an individual who was getting a loan from a bank, they would waive it. They didn't have a problem with it. Uh, if there was a substantive um, lawsuit being brought which was going to set the law, that would be a different story. And then we would talk about it at the firm. And if there was a conflict, we would refer it out to another firm. And they would happily take it because we have lots of other firms that we deal with a lot, and you know we trade cases around for that, just mm -hmm. that reason. So it sounds like a big problem. How about your work here? I did, uh, I was here for about five years, first half of it here, and then half of it at uh, the law school, um, and started with what was called the Community Enterprise Project, which I took over from Vin McCarthy, mm -hmm. and then um, it transformed into the Transactional Law Clinic when it went to Cambridge. And there were some fascinating and wonderful things that we did for the community, for individuals. And um, it was fascinating. I loved it. And I think the students really, a magical moment when I would be working with somebody and they finally understood that <coughs> as the lawyer for the client, they were going to have to make the transaction happen or they were going to have to get the result and that they didn't couldn't wait for somebody to say, now you do the next thing, and now you do this. <laughs> and it was just so exciting as the realization of what lawyering involved uh, to watch that happen as people matured. It, it was wonderful. Hugh, do you want to add something? What you I, did? I was on a committee that dealt with the conflicts uh, from time to time. We were very, very careful about communication uh, so that cases that appeared to be uh, controversial or potentially controversial over here at the clinic would be kept and handled in a way so that none of the lawyers in the firm would have the information that could constitute a, a, a conflict. And I remember with great delight, I had a client turned out to be of mine that ran into a piece of legislation uh, on landlord-tenant rights and uh, they were very upset when they heard that Hale and Dorr had drafted the legislation. I was able, uh, with great delight, to point out that no, Hale and Dorr was only the first part of the name. It was the Hale and Dorr Legal Services Center, <laughs> and they had drafted the legislation. Uh, and I, the, our firm had virtually nothing to do with it. And so we were careful about that. We were fortunate it, as Others have said we didn't have the kind of practice that generated a lot of conflicts. But I'll take this occasion to say that in terms of partnerships, this became a cultural thing in a very interesting way to me. Uh, I had always been interested in pro bono work and such as the, had the firm with a tradition of pro bono work. But as time went on, it not only was a great deal of fun to come over here as I did as an instructor, uh, and see the students grow and be reassured about why they'd gone to law school. Some of them needed reassurance. And uh, to see them gain in confidence. But on the other side of State Street, it was interesting to see uh, the center became a very prestigious factor in my personal view. And so to be asked to teach here uh, or to take cases became a matter of real pride within Hale and Door. And I think this was the magic 
obviously we had two leaders in Jack and John who set the tone, but it was very interesting. And younger lawyers were really excited to get involved and fulfilled when they did get involved. And so I would just say in terms of partnership, above and beyond the technical aspects was the cultural aspect. Mm -hmm. Rich? When I was at Harvard, there was no legal services center, but there was a Gene Charm. And <clears throat> I think Duncan Kennedy's two semesters of contracts made me survive the first year of law school. But the second year of law school, it was Gene's course on trial practice, or whatever it was then called, that made me think that law school was maybe salvageable. And it was designed to help people help low-income uh, residents. And it was mostly focused around landlord-tenant law. And while there wasn't a legal services center, the program arranged for us to work with small law firms supervised by lawyers who were affiliated with the course. And so when later on, after I started practicing at Hale and Door, there became an opportunity for a collaboration with Gary and Gene in the center, it was pretty much a no-brainer that I would want to get involved in it if I could. And so I began supervising cases, individual cases here, mostly landlord-tenant, but as Robert mentioned, there were a few other miscellaneous kinds of cases too. And I stayed involved for a number of years as the sort of litigation liaison person so that there are different kinds of litigation cases that came into the firm. I would find somebody to do them. And I also, I think, oversaw folks from other, or coordinated with folks from other departments who would supervise cases that came in in other genre. Um, and then after Hugh was a full-time resident here, and then after Rob was a full-time resident here, and they both stopped, or they both stopped working at the firm, um, I uh, volunteered to work not as much, they had done it full-time, I couldn't do it full-time because I still had a heavy caseload that I wanted to finish up. But I worked with Robert in his uh, Chilpi Center for about two and a half or three years working on some manuals on access to health care that I supervise students on. And I should mention that one of the associates from the firm, Lauren Parisi, has come up here from Washington uh, because she was so excited about working on projects here. Um, in any event, uh, we also worked on uh, some litigation matters, including an amicus uh, brief in the um, ACA case that found the ACA constitutional, which uh, Mark Fleming of Wilmer Hale did a lot of the work on, and Lauren and I also helped out a little bit. So I have to say that looking back on law school, none of this was foreordained from my second year in law school that the clinic would ever exist or that it would ever become this supportive and this important in the life of low-income people and also in the life of law students at the law school. But I have to say that at Harvard Law School, when I was a lonely and unhappy second-year law student, I probably would have been a whole lot happier. <laughs> right, Belinda, maybe you could make the last comment, then we'll give it back. So I'm a transactional attorney, as uh, Jack said, um, and I've had many touch points with the Legal Services Center and the transactional law clinical program over the years, um, starting with uh, being a second-year law student uh, doing a the Community Enterprise Project clinical program uh, during the fall of 1996. Um, it was an externship, so I wasn't based here at the uh, Legal Services Center, uh, but I worked with the ICA group, which the, was the Industrial uh, Cooperative Association that supported uh, employee-owned businesses, um, and I did a lot of the corporate kinds of work because uh, I knew I would never be a litigator. Um, but even then, the connection to the Legal Services Center was key because the classroom work was um, done here at the Legal Services Center, and I got to understand the community and all of the other programs going on here. Um, but the connection to uh, then Hale and Door was um, also really important. My supervisor was George Contreras, then a uh, junior partner at the firm, and um, that fall semester, I was interviewing for uh, summer uh, placements uh, after my 2L year, and John Hamilton interviewed me on campus, and we spent the entire 20 minutes talking about law firm culture. 
and that's what made me understand how important, you know, and uh, what a great place Hale and Dorr was. And I was fortunate enough to to go there and have had the opportunity over the years to come to the Legal Services Center and to uh, work with Linda Cole and Brian Price at the Transactional Law Clinic. So I think the connections and the partnership between the firm and the uh, law school and the Services Center is, are really strong still. Okay. Thank you. So should we talk about challenges? It's all been very happy. <laughs> Let's talk about some challenges. Who wants to talk about challenges? Tell me. I brought some challenges. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, principally two, two challenges I want to talk about, maybe two and a half. Um, I, I think as anyone who has looked at the history of law and any sort of um, movements or organizing has seen the, the dynamics that can occur, and in particular, the, the cases, the many, many cases where law and the practice of law tends to strip power from organizing. And um, one way that this has come up in the partnership that I'm talking about with Debt Collective is in, in um, student loan issues with predatory for-profit colleges, there's not a natural um, occasion to be in court unless the, the students find a way to force themselves into court, right? So it's, people aren't getting arrested for being in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they're not, um, I mean, Massachusetts is a non-judicial foreclosure case, but a uh, foreclosure state, but they're not you know, going to court to keep their houses unless, unless they're affirmatively um, going to court again. But, um, and so for us, there wasn't, um, there wasn't an obvious moment when uh, these claims of the students who were organizing to cancel all of this bogus debt would be in court. And, and on one hand, I think that people across the country rightfully felt, I have a legal claim. I'm being forced to pay. I'm being deprived of my property um, on a cause that's not valid. And, and this is a wrong that the law is committing against me. And so I should be heard in a court because that's that's how people think about it, right? It's law and it goes to a court. But um, it's actually really hard to get those claims into court. Even the debt collection of federal student loans doesn't happen in courts. And so, of course, we bring cases and we go to court. But to the extent that any of the energy or power of organizing is coming out of that opportunity to be in court and to um, you know, speak truth to power, to make rights heard, it, it wasn't frequent enough, it wasn't geographically diverse enough, right? Like we weren't in 100 courts around the country and we weren't even in court 100 times um, a year. We aren't in court 100 times a year anywhere or everywhere combined. And so we can't have a model where um, we're providing some steam to organizers. And on the other hand, people can't be waiting for that to bring their claims together and, and be thinking about how how to make change, and I think that we work best as a support to um, to people who are pursuing bigger ideas than things you, you could undertake with just law. Um, but of course, people call us all the time, members of Debt Collective from across the country, and say, like, can you take my case? Can you take this to court? Can you solve this problem with the lawsuit? And I mean, usually the answer is no for a whole variety of reasons, it, but to try to turn that no into something um, that can that can power organizing instead of uh, deflate it has been a big challenge and something that we've thought a lot about and worked a lot on. Um, the other issue, and I was worried that this one was going to be too wonky, but since we spent so much time talking about conflicts, I think, I think we're there. I think this crowd is <laughs> with us, is that the rules of professional conduct um, and you know, in general legal ethics tend, don't seem to me um, to be designed for people trying to use the law to, to make change and in fact seem seem to be put together to inhibit um, that sort of change. And so that comes up in everything from you know, some of the conflict issues we were checking about, but really um, I'm thinking principally about unauthorized practice rules and um, also to a certain extent confidentiality, right? If you're working with a large group of people who are working with each other and um, you want to be a facilitator, even if you are not yourself an organizer, I think both of those um, canons can really be destructive. And so, 
we that's another challenge that we faced is how to um, how to obviously like perform our work well within the confines of the rules of professional conduct and the norms of professional ethics without um, bowing to the idea that really some some of these notions are are not applicable in the context that we're working in or um, exist but are harmful. And so how do we fight against that without, of, of course, without um, behaving in, in any unethical way? The third um, problem that I just wanted to flag because I think it might be part of a, a future part of this panel is relationships are about trust, right? Like all, all these partnerships have, have people at both ends who trust each other and I think um, when we had a really, we have a really diffuse, Debt Collective has a really diffuse membership base and we have a relationship with members who are ev everywhere. And I think that makes it harder for our students to build those relationships, um, like more so than if there was a meeting they could go to or a place they could be. And I think it's also harder for the organizers at Debt Collective to feel strong relationships to our students. They're, they're based in New York. Um, and so that's just another challenge that right. I wanted to flag. Brent, did you want to talk about a challenge? Sure. Um, many, many challenges in terms of organizing and uh, the work uh, that came out of this partnership. Uh, like, one is just uh, the work never stops. The funding, you know, you need, you know, a lot more lawyers dedicated to this work because uh, as long as neighborhoods continue to gentrify, you know, you're going to have people displaced, you know. Uh, the neighborhoods uh, look attractive to people with higher incomes, and when they come in, when they move in, the residents, the residents who are there, you know, once they get evicted or kicked out, they can't afford to live there. So, uh, the problem was just shift. And so, uh, you know, as an organizer uh, and as the City Life and LSE partnership on radical change, and so if we don't uh, address that, we will continue to have these, have these challenges of, uh, of displacement. And of course, uh, funding, you know, is, is always very difficult to have funding to do this work. You know, sometimes, you know, like in our project, you know, it's over when the funding stops. And so, you know, uh, there needs to be more funding for uh, in legal services in general. So uh, lawyers can do this work and, you know, make, you know, society like a fairer place. You know, we don't continue to have these problems of marginalized communities. Um, and, and, and so those are some of the major challenges. And like I said earlier, just, uh, you know, you don't win every case. You know, when the judge rules from the bench and it doesn't go your way, you know, it's, it's always a challenge. However, you know, you are empowered when you fight. And so uh, you never, you know, there's never really any losses, you know, in terms of our partnership because uh, you, you win because you build a community, um, you're, you're educated, and you help others. And so, uh, but... The real challenge is that you know, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop, and as long as people come in to gentrify neighborhoods, it will continue. So that's one of the major challenges. All right. So uh, I am uh, the vice chair of Legal Services Corporation, another LSC, which the President of the United States would like to defund, which he has third time introduced a proposal to eliminate all the money. I am not allowed to advocate for any money. I'd just like to say. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Please vote. Can you, can you, can you encourage people to vote? <laughs> it, is, it is ironic that it's still the Obama-appointed board that is running this organization because along with wanting to close it down, the president also doesn't have it as a very high priority. So it's the Obama board, and we were last year able to secure $25 million more than we had the year before. So it, it, it turns out that people understand exactly what you're saying, uh, that people who have lived in communities for a long time are being pushed out, and it's not fair. And this is tr true across the country. Mm -hmm. And you go and you talk to people on the Hill and you point out these stories and they get it. And they get it in red states because actually the red states are even more dependent on these services than the blue states, not that I know anything about partisanship. So Nina. <laughs> uh, so so I, don't, I don't kind of ditto what uh, Brandon was saying. It was one of the top on my list, which is uh, funding. Resources, resources, resources. Um, Family law and I think housing law are the two areas of law that have the most uh, unmet need. And um, family law, domestic violence, it's not sexy. People don't want to uh, pay for it. Um, in fact, it's just the opposite. It's disturbing. It's ugly. Um, so we don't, get, we don't get people clamoring down to give us money to solve this problem. 
Um, so I think that kind of runs across uh, uh, legal services. And there's so much competition. Because there's so much unmet need, you know, Greater Boston Legal Services, Worcester Legal Services, everybody's clamoring for the same money. Um, and it's just not there. Uh, one of the things I think I mentioned earlier was kind of in terms of challenges with partnerships is trying to match the interests. And as we try to kind of um, adapt and, and um, address the issues that come up, it's trying to figure out with your partner where to allot the meager funds that we have and how to make changes. For instance, in the domestic violence, uh, the passageway uh, program, you know, do we <clears throat> keep doing what we're doing and do more of what we're doing because it'll never stop and just keep it, keep it up? Or do we keep doing a little bit of that and then take some time and resources to also address the housing issue in domestic violence or the consumer law problem in and consumer debt problem in domestic violence and trying to f kind of get figure out that dance with your partner as to where that sweet spot is for how to expand and how to grow um, uh, in that sense. Um, I think another thing, it's just, a, it's pretty mi macro, but I remember, especially when the, when the collaborative was just starting, was figuring out some of the conflicts and the, and the confidentiality issues. Um, and, you know, what kind of releases <laughs> and things that we need, because we're talking about very fact-specific cases. And if we're working really closely with non-lawyers, the, the advocates at Passageway, how much information do we share with them? How do we share that information? How do they share information with us? Um, and then one very, very kind of specific is the fact that um, as social workers, they are mandated reporters, reporters. Yeah. right? We're not, we're just the opposite of mandated reporters. Um, and, and figuring out how to do our work collaboratively with our partner when we may not be able to share information with them that might be helpful for them or vice versa. Um, so that was something, and we, obviously we still, we still uh, deal with that now because the collaboration is still going. Um, so I think those are, those are the ones that just come to mind very, very quickly, and I think I would just you know, end with saying resources, resources, resources. And if we can um, find a way to uh, at least get more uh, resources, we can certainly um, do some more expansion and, and address some of the needs that come up every single day. We'd have to get you a mic somewhere. It's coming. It's here it is. Here it is. Oh, okay. I want to talk about legal education. So uh, this has been kind of running around the back of my head for a long time. Um, and it is um, in, in, as career path education. We thought in not the late 1970s that um, um, we were going to become like Britain. Um, they have... Um, uh, entitlement to civil legal Olivia, aid. Yeah. Um, all of the uh, all of the peer nations that we have, Canada, have an entitlement to civil legal aid. So we needed to train people to um, move into those positions. Well, it turned out that's not what was going to happen in the United States. But it was this idea of um, where might pe where were the jobs? Where would people go? Where would they want to go? And could the third year have have a focus that I I think it's never had, Martha. It's like it's the last year you cross register, you hang out. I had students who wouldn't do clinic because they said, I'm never going to have any free time again. I play the cello. I'm going to go to concerts and I'm going to do my music because I'm not going to have any life for the next couple of years. Um, so the, the underlying question is, what about the things you would do in an office like this are skills that transfer to whatever line of work? So we partly started the transactional clinic because like we did a, we did, we one time did a low income tax credit. Very complicated. We got help from Helen Dorr on it, I know. If we did low income housing tax credits for not for profits, would that be a helpful thing for someone coming in as a first year associate at a firm? Lots of our students go there. But what would be helpful to someone who was really headed for legal aid? And could we have more connection between career advising and clinics? I, um, this may be, well, think what you want. 
I'm 74 and I'll say, <laughs> I think, I think, I think, <laughs> Martha, we're in the you same place. Say, you could say it's age, but you you're won't. You're not anymore. <laughs> I'm are. not director. Um, Give us back um, the mic. <laughs> um, I think pro, ban pro bono has been a problem. The, the culture of pro bono in schools, oh. because if it's good works, then we stop the conversation. We're not strategic. We don't think of it in business terms because it's pro bono. And I, I think what's going on in firms is first year associates aren't doing doc review anymore. I don't know what you do with the first year associates now, but what part of what they, they might do, I could imagine a partnership where if someone was interested in going into the real estate firm and we didn't have enough, we could get real estate transactions for you here, homeowners, small, small businesses, maybe representing not-for-profits with bigger deals. Um, the idea is to, that firms would have a place, legal aid might have a place, if you're looking for the third year as more of a pipeline and focusing some of the development or giving clinical education a focus. The research behind it is that we should do is um, the nature of, um, of um, complex expertise. Um, so there's a body of research out there, which Gary cited in the Loring Process book. What is the difference between a novice chess player and a master? And the answer is that their brains organize all the information that comes in differently. It gets chunked, and the only way to get there is through experience. You can't talk about it. You have to do it. You have to be immersed in a field and see example after example, um, variations on a theme, and that's why an experience, uh, Je Jeff just said to me today, I don't recall, of Jeff Selbin, one of the things about you in housing was you would hear three things about the case and you would tell us what it was about. I couldn't help it. I mean, that's because I'd done about 200 by then, and we are working in a particular economy with a particular demographic. So once all of that stuff is part of what you know, in this world, you don't know that you know it. You just know it. It feels like you don't know that you know it, but you can't get it from a book and you can't get it from a classroom. And I think we haven't thought enough about the responsibility of educators to better understand that process and to build it in. And it seems to me like the third year is, you know, or at least the second or third year. And that would promote partnerships with firms with maybe small, pra there, there are small law practices that are looking for good lawyers to train every now and then. You'd be interested in every setting. And then think of the research that we could do if we were involved in all of those settings about the business of law as it's actually functioning and under unbelievable pressures um, to change. I mean, this is My students write me papers on this for my legal profession courses. I take 60 a semester, so I get 120 good papers a year on what's going on with the bar. And I, I just think we're not ahead of it, we're not talking about it, and that that dimension um, has something to do with all of these others, and this place is still situated in a very good position to begin to take some steps along those lines. from Jean to say a word about legal education. I mean, uh, this center and the whole movement, frankly, of clinical education um, as it was prefigured here at, uh, w has now taken fire in the legal uh, education community. So experiential education is now mandated. People don't always know what it means. It doesn't always include actual service to actual people. So that's an ongoing fight. But I think that your insight, Jean, is absolutely now widely shared, that there's professional learning, there's practice learning that is only done by doing it, and ideally by doing it in a reflective context, which is not always possible once you graduate. So to actually, and, and the partnership theme of this panel is so perfect, to be able to reflect on what does it take to build a partnership? How do you invest in it uh, sufficiently? Um, so I think that the, the time is ripe for um, actually building out on this model. Um, I think that the third year question 
You know, when President Obama said in an offhand remark in an interview while he was still in office, hey, you don't need three years of law school, um, I thought to myself, did he take my class third year? <laughs> 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 but uh, you know, the, the fact is there is enough time in three years of law school to, to learn a lot of other stuff and certainly to provide some real services. And that's what this, I think, represents. This model is, is so exciting. I think the link to firms and the link to businesses and the link to other players, the link to hospitals, that we should be doing much more innovation of that nature. There's no question about that. And also, let's be frank. The medical profession made progress when it switched from the world of, well, we're just an art, we don't know how to study it, to actually studying it and retrospectively and having you know evidence-based practices. We are still in the infancy when it comes to that, in law generally and in legal education. And clinics have the opportunity to develop the, the systemic approach, Brandon's using that word, the systemic approach, so that you don't just see one, one after another after another, you see patterns and the pattern recognition. So I still think there's great possibility there and to build partnerships then inside of a university with the social scientists who are looking for projects. So there's, there's a, a lot of work that remains to be done. There's some prefiguring of that, some early stages of it, um, but more, more, that's my two cents. Um, we were supposed to continue our conversation about challenges and also turn to students. I'm going to try to ask each of you to say at least three words or more about students before we end, but are there comments, questions from anyone else who hasn't spoken who wants to? Yeah, my name's Tony Hicks. I was and there's a mic coming your way. Tony Hicks, class of 99. Um, I was hoping that perhaps the panel could address um, some of the tricky dynamics with at the front end of partnerships, where the agenda gets set, where the decision-making power is located. Nina, I was really encouraged to hear about how it wasn't the lawyers who ended up deciding what kind of cases the clinic, your, your program would bring. I, I can't help but think that that may be the exception. I think often public interest lawyers um, are coming into a model, we come into a model where the lawyers have the answers or think they have the answers and then want to partner with communities uh, or community groups who seem to fit our understanding of a problem as opposed to developing our understanding of the problem through the relationship with right. the community groups. Mm -hmm. Sarah's nodding. Do you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess I'll, um, I'll just say that um, I think the flexibility Services Center and the um, commitment of the Legal Services Center to the community and the client was pivotal in that. I mean, I, when we started the Best Way Health Law Collaborative, what we thought the clients needed was simply not what it ended up that they needed. And I remember sitting in Robert's office and saying, I don't, th and I was originally housed in your practice area. And I remember, you know, like week one, I'm a new lawyer, I'm a Skadden fellow, and I say, Robert, I don't think this is what it's gonna look like. And it was, I mean, okay, well then, we've, where do we need to be? Where do you need to be? And, and they, you know, Nana took me under her wing, you know, it, it, not having known that she was gonna have a newbie useless lawyer to train. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think, but having the, I think that very much the mindset of the center and the flexibility of it, which is a luxury, um, a allowed the, the collaboration to be as flexible as it was and as responsive um, as it was. But I, I think that that tension is ever more present where there aren't the, the, the same resources and, and the same genesis and the same um, philosophy of experiment um, and flexibility. As, it's a unique place. Yeah. I just would add that um, it's been interesting from the years of direct service work where I think the center is a very client-centered place that to now having shifted to policy work, I think what also makes us unique in the policy world is that we are still very client-centered. So for example, we do lots of work in the Southeast United States where you know, health inequities are greatest. 
and we'll sometimes have ideas as to why we're going and who we're going to meet. We now work you know, with broad groups of people with chronic serious health conditions as to what the issues are, and we come back with work that is not anything that was on our list when we got there. And I think that that you know, is mm -hmm. real, and, and, and that's what we do. The other thing I would say, you mentioned the medical piece, that I think we're also starting to realize the importance in the way that the health world has about social determinants of health, for example. And I think that when now we're working with the people that we're working with, where then the clients that we're serving, and this is on the policy space, that we really have to figure out much more than we would ordinarily do. So in my center, for example, next door to the legal services center is community servings. Community servings provides medically tailored meals um, to folks that are homebound, unable to cook. They also started as an HIV program like we do. Now it's hundreds of thousands of, of meals to people. But they're running out of money because there's no funding stream. There was an HIV funding stream, but not a funding stream more broadly. And literally in the parking lot, talking to David Waters, um, saying to him, I'm going to help you fix that, and we are going to fix that. And now part of our center, we represent the food as medicine providers across the country. We have helped them figure out how to get Medicaid, Medicare, dual demonstration, tens of millions of dollars to support their work. And so I think that there is a huge role for lawyers um, to really listen and have the um, work that they're working on defined by the community in the same way that when we did day-to-day -day direct legal service work, it was defined by the clients we serve. This is the most important uh, topic, and each of the panelists are now going to say four or five words about what you hope students are, are getting as an opportunity. But the most important point is this is in service of actual people in actual communities, and therefore uh, the definition of the needs, the partnerships need to be in service of those people, which means they have to be at the table participating and shaping what it is. Uh, four words, five words? Sure. Uh I would say growth, you know, working with the students and having them come to City Life and just be a part of the partnership is just growth for the students. Uh, they come in uh, with an open mind. They don't come in with the answers, but they're willing to learn. And over a course of time, they realize that, you know, uh, the legal work is not always the answer, but the grassroots, the protest often wins the battle. You know, however, you can't have one without the other. You know? All right. <laughs> Nina. <laughs> yeah, this is good. good. We, we've heard a lot good. of these words, you know, throughout the whole day, but, you know, the experiential learning that, stu that the students get, um, the, the fact that they're working with real clients and helping in s to solve real problems, uh, the self-reflection that we do here, I think, is, is instrumental um, so that they understand why they're doing what they're doing. We've been doing a lot of things for a long time, and um, in order to make sure that we're doing it correctly, we need fresh ideas. We need fresh folks coming in and looking with fresh eyes um, to be very critical about what it is that we're doing. Great. Robert? I would just say, at the start of everyone's career, I think, I don't care, firm, legal services, wherever you go, get some direct service experience because I think it really does inform anything that you do after that if you take in what that experience was truly like. And then for me, I would say law schools and folks need to also be thinking about the role that policy plays and the role that lawyers can play in helping to shape policy. And I think we both th th those things are really important. Jack? I would just point to page 12 of the pamphlet that's on your chairs. <laughs> Um, there's, a, there's a paragraph or two in there about a case handled by the a Veterans Legal Clinic in which two students um, brilliantly and successfully argued a very important uh, motion before the Massachusetts Landmark. Superior Court, yeah. won it. The case appeared on page one of the Boston Globe. Um, it is uh, now on appeal as of Monday, and it had to do with uh, uh, several uh, veterans of Afghanistan and Iraq who uh, had honorable enlistment periods for their first one or two periods, and their final uh, period in the military ended with a less than uh, less than honorable other th other than honorable discharge, which, um, in the view of the Commonwealth, precluded them from receiving a five hundred dollar welcome home bonus. Uh, they represent a class of four thousand people, 
And for those two students to have, because of this center, that kind of an experience and to just, when I say knock it out of the park, I thought they'd been practicing five or ten years. That's how good they were. Uh, and the judge uh, congratulated both of them and, of course, the other side um, <laughs> at the end of it. But, but it just said to me the power of the education that happens through this place. Awesome. Toby. I, I want our students to, um, to carry on the revolution, and so I think they need two things for that. And one is the tools, and two is to see where the power is. And so that's what, what I think that this partnership helps them do. Awesome. Join me in thanking this panel. And now, okay, good work. Julie McCormick will tell us everything we need to know. Uh, thank you. Um, so today has been about many things, right? As we contemplate this uh, big, beautiful, messy. Oh, thank you. You're great. You're great. You're great. Um, uh, that is the Legal Services Center. And um, you'll get a different answer no matter who you ask about what today was about. And that answer is going to change as we think about the people we've heard from um, and what we've heard from them. But, you know, considering who we are, the one thing that you won't argue with me about is that today was about words. Uh, I mean, look at who we are, uh, a room full of people engaged in the enterprise, not just of law, but at the intersection of law and education, right? The do, I mean, the say, do, say, see, do um, model, and then the three ways that we talk about the say, see, do model. So lots and lots of words. We give Jean a hard time, actually, um, and we uh, describe her um, not as a woman of few words, but hey, she's not the only one. <laughs> um, so we've heard so many words today, um, words that have resonated to connect us, um, words that have, again, fanned that spark, um, uh, the smoldering embers that brought us all here in the first place, uh, words of challenge um, from Jean, from, from, uh, from, from all of our panelists, words of tremendous optimism and uplift as we contemplate what exactly it is our work is capable of doing, um, and then words of power, muscle, and flex, um, as we saw reflected in the partnerships that were forged through here. So I'm not sure I'm going to pull this off, but these are the words of the new vernacular, like, uh, right, the uh, hashtag connect, <laughs> the hashtag, um, uh, what was it, spark, hashtag, um, uh, uplift, hashtag flex. Um, and those are the words of our stories, right, the words of the stories that we told here. And so I am honored, actually, to be offering a cupola fuckel um, of my own to add to the words that you've heard. No, I did not swear. That was not, <laughs> although I do frequently. Um, but those, that's a phrase, actually, um, that is a favorite of Irish fathers at weddings. And it means a few words. And in the context of those weddings, it's, it's rarely a few and often involves way more than words. I will not be breaking into song. <laughs> um, but as, um, Dean as the Dean said, I'm Julie McCormack, and I direct our safety net project here. And I was hired by Jean and Gary in 1994 um, to do and teach, um, again, to borrow another phrase from the old country, work that is often considered the red-headed stepchild of public interest law. Um, that work being uh, partnering with students um, and our clients to provide representation, um, challenging the denials of food, income, and health care um, by very bureaucratic, very indifferent, very unaccountable um, bureaucracies. But that was not the case here, has never been the case here. Um, I have never been the red-headed stepchild here <laughs> um, because um, Gary Bello loved a good social security case almost as much as he loved a good housing case, right? And let's be clear about the definition of good. Good is as hard a case as you could possibly imagine. And those were the cases that um, Gary uh, relished and that he taught me to relish. The other thing that Gary loved, um, I'm going to put my notes down here, is a pencil. A good, old-fashioned, um, humble, elegant, 
easily deployed, um, implement, perfectly adequate to the task of words, the good old-fashioned pencil. Um, and that pencil um, that Gary was never too far from, in fact, there's some of his pencils in the back right there, has come to symbolize for me what the essence of the Legal Services Center is. And so my final words, I'm going to draw your attention to these wonderful 40th anniversary, Wilmer Hale Legal Services Center, 40th anniversary pencils. And I'm going to remind you of the words of Congressman Kennedy, my plant from the earlier panel, um, and thank you um, from the very bottom of my heart for being here with us as we sharpen our pencils and we get the um, Wilmer Hale Legal Services Center ready for what the next um, iteration will look like as we, in the words of Gary's grandmother, um, endeavor to make what we find better. So thank you very much.